Timothy. Okay. But I was born down one day. Yeah. Today is January 28th, 1986. Yeah. And this is Joe Todd and Jean Miller and interview with Mrs. Lisa Malott Tacker in Shawnee, Oklahoma. Yeah. Okay. Ma'am, where were you born? I was born at Juanette, Oklahoma, it's in the south of here, mm-hmm. in 19, July the 28th, 1903. 1903. As my dad was working on the rail, they were putting the railroad through there at mm-hmm. that time. Who was your father? His name was William Warren Mallott, W.W. Mallott, William Warren. And, and my, your mother? I, she was a Sherwin. Uh, Myrtle Sherwin, M Y R T L, Myrtle Sherwin. Mm-hmm. And where are your parents from? Well, now let me see. I don't know. First, I heard they traveled around quite a bit. I think my parents did, because mm-hmm. I heard them going to New Mexico. Back in that day, people went and curved wagons. You know, if they wanted to try to find some different place or place they like and then they finally settled up here by Meeker and they homesteaded a place up there by Meeker and they homesteaded a uh, uh, farm up there now your father was, was he from Oklahoma well I think he was born in Kansas you see he was one of the the pot of water as you see where uh, first that I know about them are originated up around the Great Lakes. Lake, uh, well, what's that biggest lake? Michigan uh, or Michigan or Superior? Yeah. Or where Chicago is? Yeah, that's that's Michigan. Yeah, Lake Michigan. Well, that's kind of where I first heard them map. They were up there, and then the British kept pushing them back west mm-hmm. and kind of south, and they finally wound up down here in Kansas and they give them uh, land up there well then they decided they needed that they wanted to put a railroad through there and uh, so they offered them land Oklahoma was just called Indian Territory and they gave them land down here and uh, if they wanted to come they promised them land if they wanted to come down to Oklahoma well uh, my grandfather, I don't know whether he had like a wagon train or how he did, but he brought the first Potawatomis down to Oklahoma. And they settled down around uh, Juanette down there. What was your grandfather's name? Um, let's see. <laughs> oh, that's funny. His name, well, it was me a lot, but uh, he was friend. Oh, Joseph. Joseph my lot. Okay, and how did the French pronounce it? They could have pronounced Milo. Milo. They left off the T's, mm-hmm. but they spelled it with the yeah. T's. Now, why did he bring the Potawatomis down? What was well, uh, they were two tribes up there. Or, you know, they divided. They were the Citizen Band and the Prairie Band. And uh, they were kind of difficult about and the government offered them land down here. They wanted that land there in Kansas. They was going to put a railroad through there. Mm-hmm. And so our band, our bunch of Potawatomis, decided they'd come on south. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... Um, he brought the first load, my grandfather. What year was that? Oh, don't ask me. I guess it's in the 70s, somewhere along in there. 1870s? Somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, why was he chosen to bring them down? What? I didn't know. No, he just offered to, I guess, and they just let him. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I don't know all the details on that. My dad never did talk too much about it, but he talked about as he was growing up here in Indian Territory, you know. Of course, the country's pretty wild then, even... You can't go find a hardly wild place now. That's true. And uh, so many people's all over the country, you know, settled even in the mountains and everywhere else. But uh, he talked like he killed a, a black panther down there in the 
wilderness down in there when he was a teenager. Now your grandfather was French and your grandmother was Potawatomi. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to get some history on the Potawatomi Indians. Just general history on them. Well, now I don't know because when I was growing up, um, we never, we never, Dad went to Sacred Heart School down here. They had a, on the Potawatomi land, see the Indians, the Catholics were good to the Indians. And so that's why there's a lot of Indians today that are Catholics. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a school, they tried to teach them, you know, school. And they made a school down here at Sacred Heart. And that's where my dad got what his education that he got was down there. Did he talk about going to school there at Sacred Heart? Yeah, he went to school there. Uh, when was that school founded? Well, no, I, I don't exactly know. I've read it, I think, but then I don't remember right off mm -hmm. hand. Uh, when is, did you go to Sacred Heart? Did you no. Go to the no, I went to just public school. Okay. What stories did your father tell about going to Sacred Heart? He didn't tell many stories. My dad didn't talk too much about it. We tried to get him to talk about it, and just once in a while that he would say anything. Dad was a Catholic up until, well, a young man, and he married, uh, his first wife was a year hard, I believe now, mm -hmm. and she died, I think, in childbirth. They had one son, and then he, uh, you know, they had the uh, circuit riders or whatever they call them, preachers went around through the country, you know, and have revivals at schoolhouses or under brush arbors and different things. Well, my dad become a Christian. And then the Lord called him to preach, and he was a preacher. So we didn't we didn't go to Catholic school around, and he never did talk about, oh, he talked some about the Catholic faith, about how you had to pray and different things like that. But he never did tell us too much about his early days. The uh, uh, Potawatomi, you say, originated up around the Great Lakes. Well, that's where they first heard of them. We don't know exactly the original. And the French were good to the Potawatomi. They kind of tried to teach them and, and help them out. But the, the English were pushing them back all the time. They were taking over, you know, from the East Coast there. They were pushing them back and back and back and trying to get rid of them. But then they finally, they came down from around the Great Lakes down there further to see where was it they come to, and then they come on into Kansas. They made two or three, but they gradually pushed down there too. Do you know when they came to Kansas, that what year? No, I don't. I guess it's down on the record somewhere, but then... Uh, Do you know? Do you know what? Yeah. It was in the... Uh, oh, I read it in uh, Father... Joseph Murphy's dissertation. Uh, they were first settled on um, Council Bluffs and in what became the Louisiana Purchase in Missouri. Yeah. And then they wanted to relocate them, the two different groups together on the Kansas Reservation. And that may have been in the late 30s or, or 40s, early 40s, when yeah. they got them together on what in the St. Mary's, Kansas area. That was the Potawatomi Reservation. Yeah. That's 1830s? 1840s, I think, is yeah. when they finally reunited the two different bands, and they were like water and oil, no mix. The Citizen Band and the Prairie Band, and they, uh, you know, they like they had chiefs of each one. They just like two separate tribes, nearly, but they were the same type. Of why the different names? The Prairie Band, Citizen Band. Now I don't know why they had different names like that. Mm -hmm because I wanted to get a his, as much history on the Potawatomi's as I could. I had a grandson that he's in Iowa now. He's a mining, uh, well, he has charge of the mining business up in Idaho. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, Grandma said, can you get me some historical facts about the Indians and all of it said he'd like to have more information on that. And I said, 
Well, I don't know, uh, Joe. I said, I just don't know where I could get it at. I guess I could go to the library and maybe see if they had anything on the mm -hmm. historical facts. They did the Indians and the Indian art and stuff like that. I, I like that. Um, did you know your grandfather? No, I never did see him. Mm -hmm. He was dead before I ever came along. What about your grandmother? Oh yeah, Grandma and I was good friends. I stayed with her quite a bit. And Tell me about some stories she told you about the Indians, about the Potawatomis. Well, now she didn't tell me a great lot about the Indians, but I, when I was a kid, just old, five or six years old, and before I started to school, I, I was about the only one of the kids that left to stay with Grandma. Mm -hmm. But her and I got along just fine. And she showed me how to quilt, and of course she lived by herself then. She lived down at one end at that time. Mm -hmm. And I'd sit around and try to sew too, just like she was sewing. What was her first name? Her name was, um, I believe it's Catherine. Catherine, and what was her maiden name? I don't know whether it was a Netto or a Berso, one or the other. But she was a part of Waterman. Yeah, she was. I I would say she was a full blood part of Waterman. Mm -hmm. uh, but could you just tell me some stories she told you about the early days? Oh, I don't know. As she told me, of course, I was just a kid then. But she, she lived mostly after she got to where she couldn't take care of herself with my dad, one of my dad's brothers. And his name was Louis Malone. More of her children were boys. She had Ed, and, and they lost a brother. His name was Joe Malone. I remember that. And then uh, let's see, Ed uh, Malone and Dad. My dad was William or Will. They called him. And. Uh, mm -hmm. And Lewis and uh, uh, Tom. Let's see. They had one girl and they lost her. Mm -hmm. And after she married. And I don't know. Lee. Oh, that it was a Lee Milan as one of the boys. Lee. And then Tom was the youngest. And and he's still, I don't know whether his, one of his sons is still living. Mm -hmm. I think he is. He's about my age. Mm -hmm. um, now you say your grandfather was French. Mm -hmm. When did his family come to this country from France? Well, now that I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I've never heard him say when, but whether he was born here of French parents, you know, there was, Quite a few French came over here, you know, mm -hmm. and he might have been born over here. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kind of work your father did? Well, he was a carpenter. Mm -hmm. he, they farmed some at times. You know, during Depression days, sometimes you'd go to the farm thought you had to make a living, and then you'd sell out and you'd come back to town, so on and so forth. So. He he farmed a lot, and then he he was on the business committee and was able to go to Washington D.C. here one time. And uh, I took him one time after he had a stroke up here at this Indian hospital. Uh, where is it? Up Pump City or something? It's Pawnee. Uh, Pawnee. Pawnee. Mm -hmm. Pawnee. <laughs> Pawnee. Pawnee. Went to No, it. Uh, I don't think it was Pawnee. It's over this way. See, Mike Moore. Because I, I took the car up there. There is, well, there's one in that area up there, I know. Mm -hmm. Is it a punk or a Pawnee? I think. Well, yeah, there's one at Pawnee. I know there was, but not then. Now, because I had one daughter that was a laboratory technician that worked in the Pawnee Hospital for about 10 years. See, I had seven daughters and two sons. So during the Depression days, 
We had lived in the country for a while, and then we'd come back to town, and we'd go to the country. We were living in town when, in the 20s, when the Depression hit. Was that in one end? Huh? Was that in one end? No, we lived here in town. Oh. My husband lived out north of town. Have you heard of what's called Adla? Yeah. About eight, six, eight miles north of town. What's the name of it? Adla. There's no, there used to be a depot there. If you went anywhere, you went on a train. Mm -hmm. And people from down here, if they wanted to go home, lived up in that part of the country, they either went to Adlot or they went to Meeker. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, uh, his folks homestead, my husband's folks, came from Tennessee. And they came up there in that part of the country and homesteaded up there. When did they come here? What, what year? Well, now, my husband was born, you see, I'll be 83, and he was a year, a four years older than I, and his birthday was the 1st of January. He was, he's a year older than the calendar, so he'd been 87. Mm -hmm. And did they, did they make the land run when they homesteaded? No, no, they just come up from... They came first to Tennessee, and then they gradually moved on up this way and moved up. How'd they come to Oklahoma? How'd they travel? I think they traveled in wagons, I believe. Mm -hmm. Did your husband ever talk about the... He was only baby when they come yeah. out here. Because mm -hmm. okay. he was 19. We were both teenagers when we married. He was 19 and I was just 50. And he's afraid he, he had to register for the war that was going on. And uh, then he was called up for examination and he didn't pass. And we weren't married about two weeks and we both, that's 1918 when the flu raged. Yeah. And we both come down with the flu and he was down for about a month. He took pneumonia. And, and take a couple of kids and just married and no job and I tell you right now it's rough going. What medicine did they use in that flu epidemic? Do you remember? I, do, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. We used a lot of the old time remedies whenever he took a back set with pneumonia. We had, uh, we didn't have enough heating pads or, you know, or hot water bottles like they have now. So we made salt packs. We'd sew up a bag of, uh, put salt in it, and then we'd heat it in the oven, and uh, we'd grease with the, uh, you know, his chest and his back of his lungs with turpentine and camphor and stuff like that. Did you ever, you know about that? My mother used that on us when we lived at one end. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's what we'd use. We'd, uh, heat this uh, camphor and grease as hot as we could stand our hands in and then we'd just rub him and grease him all over with that and then we'd put them hot packs on it and we had his pneumonia broke up by the next day. Hmm. It'll work. Yeah. Any other home remedies that you used? Well, now when uh, when my kids begin to get up bigger, they go to school. Of course, kids get everything that's going on in school. And they got the itch, and we used sulfur and grease for that. Sulfur and lard. Yeah. Yeah. You'd use that for that, and let's see, now what else was it? Well, of course, they got head lice and everything else, but you just washed their heads and picked them off. <laughs> you just had to do the best you could. Did many people die of the flu around here, that flu epidemic? Oh, died? yeah, there was a lot of people died with it. What caused that flu? Where did it come from? Oh, don't ask me. I don't know where it come from. Out of the blue sky somewhere or other. Mm -hmm. It got started, and it's just like a plague that swept through the I country. I heard someone said it came home with the soldiers from Europe from the war. I, I don't know. Well, see, they were sending all of our boys over there. Yeah. So... They wouldn't have had time to win on that guy and grow it back. Mm -hmm. You say that you remember statehood? Yeah. Tell me about what you remember. 
Well, I just remember my dad and him talking about it and him saying, well, they ought to have been in the run or something like that, you know. He was working there in one at They was building a railroad to go down. My folks did live in bars. My dad and mother moved around quite a bit. And I don't like move around <laughs> very well. I like to go places. But then I don't like to have my permanent home <laughs> in different yeah. places. But they moved around quite a bit. They owned several restaurants and worked at that for a while. And then they been on the farm. And then they done this and done that. Were the uh, Potawatomi's for or against David? Well, now I wasn't big enough to know nothing about politics at that time, whether they were or weren't. I guess they were. Mm -hmm. But I remember them talking about the people, you know, lining up and driving in here to get all the land they could, and I guess they got some of the best of it. Hmm. Um, did Potawatomi still practice any of the old traditions? Well, not as much as some of the other Indians. The Potawatomi seemed to me like were more educated or civilized than they didn't keep a lot of the old traditions that some of the Indian, other tribes of Indians yeah. did. Do you still speak the language? Oh, I never did learn to speak yeah, them. Uh-uh. Oh, we never did. Uh, my dad never did uh, speak Indian. He did. Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. uh, did the Potawatomis have the clans, the different clans? Well, no, I don't think so. I think there's all generally just the one... One tribe, as far as I can remember. Mm -hmm. Of course, they got a lot of the other tribes kind of mixed in with them, like the Seminoles, the Creeks, and things like that. But other than that, I don't think they... Mm -hmm. They never had different clans of their own. Of course, everybody did see everything just like. You, know, you don't find that everybody doing that today. Uh, is the tribe organized pretty much today as it was in the early days that you remember? Well, it's more, uh, it's different. They got more ideas and different things nowadays. Uh, then the main thing that they were concerned about and what they worked on, see the government promised them to pay them so much for our moving or something. I don't know why. But they, the government paid them, and uh, they had, I don't know how many treaties. They called them treaties or, you know, contracts or something. And they worked, my dad worked on that, and him and Bursaw, I think it was, or I believe it's Bursaw, they were able to go to Washington, but I don't believe they ever did to try to get in favor. But now when my son was down here on the business committee, him and Billy Birch and them, they finally got, uh, they combined the treaties together and the government paid them off. That's when we all got $700 a piece. And ones that had died, already died and gone on, why, I guess they've just been using that money. I think that went into the general fund. I think they did because they, even though our ones is on roll, you know, they still, they draw money too. Are you an original enrollee? I've been on roll ever since I've been born, I guess. Mm -hmm. Have they closed the rolls, the Potawatomis? Are they closed? No, not for, uh, they're not, they don't take, I think, a 16th anymore or mm something. -hmm. You have to be eight, eight and born. Uh, Let's see, after 1961, at least an eight, and anyone before, it's like, it was, you know. Yeah, I know, because I was taking some of my, my last grandkids, see, my daughters and them's all eight, and uh, my last grandkids, I tried to put them on roll. Now, the earlier ones that I got on roll, they, they drawed money too, but the last ones I couldn't, they wouldn't put them on roll. As a small girl, what chores do you do around the house or on the farm? Well, I, yeah, as a small girl, I just learned to wash dishes, I guess, about the first thing, had to wash dishes. 
And then I learned to cook, and because I was a pretty good cook by my was a teenager. Mm -hmm. What kind of house you lived in in Wanette? Well, now, I don't remember what kind. It was just a little frame house, I think. It was pretty good when we lived down there. Mm -hmm. I went to school there in Wanette till the fourth grade. And uh, then whenever, 1911, we went to Oregon. They heard Dad was trying to farm and he didn't make nothing on the farm, so... They, uh, some of Mom, my mother's sister's folks had went to, to Oregon and the, uh, the mills, the wood mills and factories and things was going good out there then. How'd you travel to Oregon? On the train. On the train? They packed the lunch in a box about, it was half as big as this. What, about two or three feet square? Yeah. yeah. Packed the lunch to do us. We... Oh, we hear all kinds of stories, you know, and it did take us two or three days to go on the train up there. Mm -hmm. That we might get, you know, sidetracked and that. <laughs> oh, I know they had some scary stories told that, but we made it through just fine. But every one of us, you didn't have suitcases then like they got now, you know. And they had some suitcases, and my mother was expected. We went out there in December, and my youngest sister was born in January. What part of Oregon did you settle in? We went to Rainier. That's on down from Portland, down the river to, we just about 30 miles from the coast. Mm -hmm. And we knew what we talked about. I heard the folks talking about going on to the coast, but we never did get to go down there. Hmm. But I did get to go. I, of course, I was a kid, but uh, we had some neighbors that young folks and they were expecting their first child and I know his mother lived across the river over in Washington so of course I was always around my I was always smarty pants I guess <laughs> and got noticed you know so she wanted his mother came over when their baby came and stayed for a week or so and then they was farming over in Washington and uh, so she asked me to go home with her. Well, of course, I wanted to go, and Mama didn't let me go. And I went over there and stayed with her about a month mm -hmm. in Washington. But she had a, a nearly a teenage boy, or a boy about 11 or 12, and I was only about, uh, I was about six years old, I guess, or more. And he just delighted to tease me, and he tickled me. Oh, I never could stand to be tickled. I just had fits, so whenever he was around the house, I stayed around with the, his mother there. If she was cooking, I'd stand around by her during cooking time, stay out of his way. So when did you come back to Oklahoma? Well, we only stayed out there a little over a year, about 60 months. Mm -hmm. And it rained so much, you know, sun just be shining just as bright, and all at once would just be pouring down rain. And of course, my mother grew up in Oklahoma, and she couldn't <laughs> she couldn't take that. And then my baby sister kind of had like a bronchitis or something, and so she thought we had to get back to Oklahoma. We all would live, you know, or she'd lose the baby. But anyhow, we came back, and uh, then Dad stayed a while longer. Uh, he worked in the mills, and. Rainier was built like nearly, I can remember how it was built, nearly Main Street was just like a boardwalk nearly out over the edge of the river. Mm -hmm. And then they had, uh, you had to climb stairs to go up to the next street. You had to climb steps. And uh, up on the mountain, it's on the side of the mountain is what it was. And uh, then when you got up to the next street, well, while you was going up there, you could look down under your stairway there, and there was they had sloughs, what they call sloughs, built, and they'd get up there on the mountain, cut them trees, and they'd put them in these sloughs and water them, slide them down to the river, you know. Mm -hmm. Then they'd get them down to the river, and then they'd make rafts out of them. They'd tie a whole bunch of them together, you know, and men would walk on them and 
guide him and take him down to the next place, I guess. To make what was the sawmill in that area? Well, they was all along the riverfront. They was six sawmills, I think, and one factory in that one in Rainier there when we were there. Who owned those? Were they? Oh, I don't know who owned them. We had big boats coming up the river, and a lot of the big boats, they had to be tugboats. Yeah. Take them up the river, you know. They'd go clear up to Portland. But you could, um, foggy morning line, you could hear them going to, 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 you know, keep from running into mm -hmm. one another. So when you came back to Oklahoma, did you come back to one at or Shawnee? No, we didn't come back to either one of them. I believe we'd come around close to Bristol. Mm -hmm. I believe that close to where we come. <coughs> you settled yeah. on the farm? Yeah. My dad, uh, I think that's after we come back to Morgan, uh, helped his brother on the farm, Lewis. He lived out north of one there. Mm -hmm. And then we finally moved into town. <coughs> and, uh, oh, we just moved around a lot. I don't know. Can't remember all the places we did move, but uh, anyway, we're still here today. <laughs> um, you say that in the depression that you lived on the farm for a while and moved in the city. Well, uh, we lived. He was the independent. But then uh, we lived in town uh, for a while, and then we went to the farm. And we lived down the farm, there, and then the price fell out. Cotton was a pretty good uh, price, and we was farming for his brother-in-law on the halves. And the uh, time we give him his half, we'd had to borrow money to pay for the ones pick our the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So we just give our half to him and told him. He'd have some left, you know, he's hard pickers. And then we uh now let's see, we moved over on what was called the home place. His dad the place his his dad died the year before we were married and his mother and she had more boys than she had girls. And uh so they uh, they persuaded her to move to town. So she did, and and we lived there for a year or so on what is called the home place. And then we moved over on an Indian lease, and then we stayed there for a year or so, and uh, we were accumulating a pretty good uh, own livestock quite a few. We had some big perching mares and we had some great big mules, young mules. And What's an Indian lease? Well, it was Indian land and they let you lease it or, you know, rent it, I guess you'd call it. And they called it Indian lease. Did you have an allotment? Uh, no, I never did have an allotment. Dad had an allotment down around one end. He had two eighties. He got two eighties. Mm -hmm. But I think he sold them both for about five hundred dollars. They got oil wells on them then. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they ended a lot of them, and I guess still are, to get a hold of some money now. That's the main thing. They didn't think about the future. They, they'd live such a free, mm -hmm. Unencumbered life till it just go and buzz in. Did you do any work for the war effort in World War One? No, like I said, during World War One, I, I was just a teenager, mm -hmm. so I didn't work in any of the Red Cross or anything like that. And we got married, and then when we got married, we both got the flu, and I was down for about ten days, and he was down for a whole month. And uh, he took 
the back set with pneumonia. And we just had the one hospital over here in town at that time. He was working for a lumberyard. And the doctor came out to the house and he told us, he said, there's no need taking either one to the hospital. He said, they got me out in the halls now. So we just had to stay at home. And he'd come out there and give us medicine. And after I finally got up, why well, then I had to take care of him. Who did your chores while you were both down? Well, we really didn't have any chores. Now, when we got married, his mother gave us a cow and a hog. Well, how could we take care of just two of us, a hog, or buy feed for a hog <laughs> in town? We lived out on South Draper over there. And that pig got out, I guess, because he's starting to death nearly. And uh, I had got up from over the flu, and this pig got out, and somebody, kid or somebody, told us, said, your pig's out. I said, I saw a pig off down there, about two blocks or more in the south of us. I said, oh, I guess that's ours, because he was going from the little building we had there. So I got out in this kind of a cloudy, uh, dampish morning, and I went down that way and I found that pig. You know, they say you can't drive a pig, but somewhere or other I got that pig up there and came back in the building. Mm -hmm. I don't know how in the world, <laughs> but I did it. <laughs> what did you do on Armistice Day, the day the war ended? Oh, my husband was in bed. And uh, he was still with flu, you know. And my mother was up there, and the whistles, we had two shops here, you know. We had the Santa Fe shop and the Rock Island shops in town. And the whistles began to blow and the horns to toot and everything. And Dad was about half delirious, and he wanted Mom to make them stop, hush. They making too much racket. But... Uh, we was glad that it was over with. Was there a big celebration here in Shawnee? Well, now I think there was quite a bit of celebration at the uh, hall, let's see, the Veterans Hall or something, but we weren't never into anything like that because he hadn't had to go and he was sick anyway and didn't know whether he's going to live or not. And so. We never did take part in anything like that. Did the part of one of these do they have the traditional Indian dances? They didn't then so much as they do now. Mm -hmm. A lot of them went back now and have every year the what they call the powwow. Yeah. Um, now is that is that traditional in the part of one of the tribe or have they adopted that from? Well now I don't know whether that was their tradition or not. I couldn't say for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that's why I'd like to get some of the historical facts on them. I just don't know, but they begin to have the, oh, those powwows. I don't know when they first begin to have any powwow. They were usually in conjunction with the uh, tribal council in June. Yeah. That same week. Mm -hmm. I know they used to be. Yeah. Can you tell me what food you cooked in the Depression? Well, I don't know exactly, but I, uh, when we went to the farm, well, when we, we lived in town then for a while, we went to the farm, like I said, and we had a pretty good start on the farm. Well, my husband, they called it, said he had asthma. But after, in later years, when he had to go to the hospital, the uh, doctor said he had a heart condition, said you'd have like uh, hard breathing or something if you had a heart murmur or something like that but well, what I cooked uh, when we were to buy a lot of groceries when we went back to the farm why well, of course we had a cow and we always churned our own butter and uh, I was made out of all of our bread biscuits and cornbread and light bread I made more light bread than anything I baked it on bread. And if we had any fruit, we'd make cobblers. Or if we had enough eggs, we'd make uh, 
lemon pies and things like that. My husband loved it. He was a sweets man. He loved the sweets. And uh, so we'd have hot biscuits and things like that. And then uh, when we got to where we growed some pigs, we'd have pork and meat. And then first we had, when they first got the lockers here in town, before you had the refrigerator that had a freezer part on it, you know, why they'd have what we called ice boxes. But uh, we had killed a calf or beef and put it in the freezers, you know, in the lockers here in town. Whenever we'd go to town, we'd get us two or three chunks of meat. Mm -hmm. So you ate pretty good in the Depression, then. Well, you? we had something to eat. There's one year we didn't have too much. But we had a neighbor lady that they was in pretty good shape. She had quite a few chickens. I raised I raised a bunch of chickens that year. I had an incubator that I had bought just before we left the farm, a new one. And so my mother or somebody brought me the eggs and I used them and hatched out some chickens. But they hadn't got big enough to eat, but my neighbor lady did have some. And she'd make a big pot of chicken and dumplings. She had several kids. She lived across the road from us. And uh, the kids wouldn't eat it at her house. And so she'd just bring it down to my place. Well, then when my kids wanted to eat it, why, well, her kids wanted to eat too. So <laughs> that's kid's style, you know. Mm -hmm. They'd see my kids eating it, why, well, then they want some. And so we'd get a plate and they'd eat up all the chicken and dumplings or whatever she brought in. But did uh, people help each other pretty much in the Depression? In those some days? did, some did, mm -hmm. some did. Yeah. There's always some selfish people, you know, who care whether you Speaking of eating, we better get over there. It's oh yeah, it's that day. Them wines, them the gold through. Okay. Thank you.